Hi, friends. It's good to be back together to reflect on Psalm 22 as we've been doing all week. Psalm 22 begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We recognize, we recognize those as the words of Jesus on the cross. And as we're looking at that this week, uh, we're seeing that if we look at these, those words in isolation on the cross, they will not help us understand what Jesus is experiencing. Uh, but rather, if we see them in the context of Psalm 22, which begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We'll be able to understand Jesus better. But also, uh, we'll be able to have a place to put our own stories because we see that God's word is the best way for us to interpret our own lives. And David wrote Psalm 22 uh, not simply to look forward to Christ, but also to give words of lament to God's people so that we can put ourselves in the experience, we can interpret our lives through the psalm, that we have words to express our experience, and that we have uh, hope, right? Because this puts us squarely in, in a relationship with God, and that's where we get to see today. The psalm gives us permission to pour out our hearts in an honest way that honors God at the same time. The psalm starts out with deep despair. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? so far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yesterday, we looked at some of the trouble, the, the bulls of Bashan and the roaring lions, things that represent powers greater than ourselves, the, the pack of wild dogs, the, the band of evildoers that represent the... Um, the depths of the, uh, of the victim, uh, the, the psalmist being the victim of circumstances beyond his control. And then today we get to the end of the psalm, starting in verse 22. I will back up just a few verses. The, the trouble ended with this in verse 19. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. And then in response to the lament and the cry for help, listen to how the psalm comes full circle now. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. And then the psalmist talks to God. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. And so ends Psalm 22. What begins on the, a note of the deepest despair ends on a note of the highest praise. And as the psalmist talks of, about this praise, we see a couple of things happening. First of all, uh, remember at the beginning of the psalm, everybody had forsaken him. He was alone, alone in his despair, crying out to God. And now I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. The psalmist finds himself squarely in the midst of God's people, in the assembly, 
in the midst of his brothers, his spiritual brothers. And this is the context now for the end of the psalm. The psalmist is in the community of people, in the community of God's people. And that's a beautiful place to be. And it reminds us, as we put ourselves in the psalm, as we use the words of the psalm to cry out, wherever we are, if we're in the midst of the despair or if we are facing the troubles, we know where the story goes with God. We know that even when we feel alone, uh, our, the truth is that we are rooted in a community of believers uh, that spans the ages and that crosses the globe. Our feelings oftentimes betray us, but the truth never does. Our feelings of being alone, uh, always we need to experience and, and interpret within the truth of being part of a worldwide community of believers and being part of a community of believers that God holds in his hand, that we are the apple of his eye, that he protects us and shields us. The other, one of the other beautiful things we see about this is simply the progression from, uh, from despair to praise. And that helps us, as we looked at earlier this week, as we, as we use the psalm to interpret our own experiences, we remember that there is something beyond what we are in right now. Uh, yesterday was April 8, and we were talking about the bulls of Bashan and the roaring lions and all the trouble. April 8 also happens to be the anniversary of one of the most uh, painful experiences of my whole life. I would put it in the top five, possibly even in the top three, right up there with miscarriages and, and the loss of my father. But uh, in the midst of the trouble that I was experiencing, uh, words that the psalm gives us, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was, that was the cry of my heart, and that's how I felt. I felt alone like that. But the psalm reminds me that that as I, I faced those, uh, those powerful bulls and roaring lions and the, the packs of wild dogs, that I'm not alone. And so even in the midst, when I can't see the end, the word of God gives us hope that there's more coming. And so we see that. Uh, we see that in the psalm and we can lean into it. And now as I reflect on that experience in my life, I still rank it as a painful experience. I would never call the experience good, but I see that God is good. And that's an even better lesson than making experiences good, seeing that God is good. And it could be that you're in the midst of something right now that you, you have trouble seeing uh, a, a silver lining to a cloud. You, you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. But Psalm 22 reminds us that God is there and God is with us and there is more beyond what we experience now. As I look, I look at where I am right now, I'm in the midst of a, of a pandemic. I'm the pastor of a, of a church that's filled with love for God and love for people. I'm surrounded by new friends. I'm surrounded by supportive leadership and I can contribute my own gifts to, to the body here where I feel like I have purpose and, and a place. But as I look at the journey that brought me here, uh, even to Faith Community Fellowship, one that began you know, years and years and years ago to become a pastor, and then the, the events more recently to bring me here. Some of those events are really joyful events, and some of those events uh, and processes are very painful events but each one of them is part of that process. The psalm reminds us that, uh, that we don't separate the high points in life from the low points in life and simply say the high points give us value and the low points are things that we need to forget. But rather, just, just like the psalm begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And ends with the phrase about God, he has done it. Those things are 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 married into, uh, into each other in our lives. And God redeems even those painful parts of our lives to bring about beautiful things. 
again, not that we would say that those experiences are good in and of themselves, but rather God is good and he makes beautiful things happen through them. But now the most beautiful thing is we look at this psalm and we hear Jesus' words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if that's all we heard, we would possibly be in despair. We, wouldn't, we might have trouble understanding the relationship between heavenly father and the eternal son of God. But I firmly believe when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wants us to hear the whole story that's going on. And so Jesus becomes the one who in the midst of the assembly gives God praise in all things. He is the one who ends up saying he has done it. He has conquered even death. And so what I would say is the world's deepest despair on a human level where the son of God is put to death on a cross in an unjust manner becomes the best good news possible where God has done it. He has brought about eternal justice where uh, our sins are not uh, borne by us because we could never carry that weight, but rather Christ has borne the weight of our sins. And not only has God brought about justice in that way, but he's reunited himself with us, us with himself. And he, as we read in Colossians, is reconciling to himself all things, not just human souls, but all of creation is, is groaning as in the uh, pains of childbirth. And God is bringing all things to himself. And he says to us in his word, I am making all things new. And God is making that come true. So in this Psalm, we see the, the pain of the cross united with the glory of resurrection in, in God. And so <laughs> what is in one sense the worst day ever, now we call Good Friday. Friends, I wanna encourage you to see your own story in this Psalm. Maybe you're at the end of the Psalm right now and you can reflect on difficult times in your life and you can say, with knowledge and experience, he has done it and give glory to God. But maybe you're just in the beginning and I would encourage you to hold on because Psalm 22 becomes your whole story. And there is a he has done it moment that will redeem your life from the pit. I think it's very appropriate today that we would close with the words of Jesus as we think about the uh, the the how the despair is met by the victory of God. Jesus says this at the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, and see if you find yourself in this story as well and find hope in Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All the rich of the earth will feast in worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him, Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. As Christ said on the cross, it is finished. The victory is won. He has done it. Thanks be to God for this indescribable gift of grace.